Hello friends, James Stevenson back with part four in my Tesla earnings forecast video review series. Uh, in part one, we looked at production and deliveries and how I forecast those. In part two, we looked at revenue. And then in part three, I should have looked at cost. But instead of looking at cost, I went through all the pretty charts that were left in my 69 tweet forecast thread. So I succeeded in getting through the first 29 tweets of that 69 tweet thread. But uh, I can't move on to the next tweet, the income statement, until after I've covered cost. So that's the other element you need to be able to cover the top half of the income statement. Uh, we already know where the revenue is coming from. It's the combination of those production and deliveries forecasts and the revenue per vehicle, or in the case of energy, revenue per megapack or solar panel or whatever. What we don't have yet uh, is a solid grounding on where the numbers came from for my cost of sales forecasts. So uh, I'll bring in my co-host Loki before I forget to do that. Wouldn't that be terrible if I forgot to bring Loki into the shot? And uh, you can keep an eye on Loki if he does anything interesting in the Loki cam. While I turn my attention to that last tweet that we looked at here, uh, I'll scroll down a little bit and show you that this is the income statement that uh, I don't feel right covering yet. Uh, until after I've shown you stage three from my detailed forecast model. So I'll keep scrolling down past all this stuff that I'm going to review in a future video, but not in this one. Uh, and you've already seen stage two. So... Here we are. Uh, from tweet 58 in the 69 tweet forecast thread, I said stage three of my detailed forecast is estimating the cost of sales per vehicle produced at the same level of option detail as the estimated revenue per vehicle projected in stage two, beginning once again with Fremont. All right, so I could show it to you this way. That would be real small on your screen instead of doing it that way. What I think I'll do is just dispense with Twitter and run right to my live Excel forecast model from January the 14th, same one that we showed. And I've already queued this up to stage three. The same uh, screenshot we just saw is exactly this uh, from row 586 of my detailed model tab. And I've zoomed in enough here that you can see all of 2023 for context these are actuals, and when I say actuals, I don't mean Tesla has reported these numbers. I mean, all the numbers that are shown here, if you add them up, add up to the same numbers Tesla did report for cost. Uh, what I don't know is if I have distributed the costs by model and site uh, accurately. It would be a miracle if I did, right? But in total, when you add them up, right, when you multiply by the number of vehicles delivered, these do come out to the costs that Tesla reported. Okay, then for this column, the production and delivery numbers way up uh, higher on the page have been updated already to what Tesla reported for Q4, but Tesla has not reported any dollar impacts yet for Q4. So this is still my forecast. And of course, uh, these are also my forecast for 2024 and 2025, uh, but probably I should just focus on Q4 2023, as that is the next quarter Tesla will be reporting, and just show you the latest on this. So uh, it's, uh, it's important if you do the forecast the way I'm doing it to ask the question, what's the average cost of a Model S? The average cost of sales per vehicle produced at Fremont, which is the only place Tesla makes Model S, I think it's about seventy-six thousand uh, dollars per Tesla Model S produced, uh, and this is the breakdown of that at the same level of detail as the revenue section. So, in the revenue section, we asked, "Hey, for every one of these options, what's the take rate on that option, and what's the price of that option?" And if you multiply those by each other, that'll give you the average revenue per option uh, for that kind of model produced at that site. Same idea here with the cost section. Everybody gets the base configuration, which is why that's the largest number on the page, right? It's not an option to not take the base configuration. You have to take the base configuration. And then for each of the rest of these, 
okay, uh, how much is the cost of this item? So like right now, uh, this paint item is free for people to, to buy Model S's. Uh, Tesla says no charge for any color Model S you want, but there is still a cost associated with painting Model S's. So I'm showing my estimated cost here. Uh, then for the performance package, for the plaid edition of Model S, I'm not saying it only costs $2,300 to make uh, a plaid Model S versus a, a, a standard or a base Model S. I'm saying the take rate on people wanting a performance package times the upgraded cost uh, to Tesla to produce that package is an average of $2,300 per Model S including both those that have the performance package and those that don't. I hope you got uh, how this works. Uh, wheels, same idea. Interior, full self-driving, same idea. Like, I, I could put zero for full self-driving incremental cost, but I'm putting something here because Tesla does have people who work on the full self-driving team, and I want to allocate out that fixed cost base. Uh, to all of the vehicles that they're supporting with, with some some token amount. All right, so that's how you get to the cash buyer cost of sales on a Model S. Uh, there is no incremental cost associated with uh, delivering a vehicle as leased as opposed to a uh, cash buyer. So there's no impact here, even though there is a revenue impact in the revenue section, there's no cost impact. It's the same cost to make uh, an identically configured leased vehicle as it is to make a cash buyer vehicle. Same same car, same cost. Destination and delivery fee, I put a little money in for that. Regulatory credits is a small amount of money. And other, uh, not a lot of money there either. So that's how you get to this total amount, 76 grand. And over the course of time, I do expect that to improve some uh, as Tesla improves, you know, uh, the product, making, making it better, finding uh, lower cost or more locally sourced uh, suppliers for those parts, uh, reducing the amount of workers who are on the line, uh, speeding up the line. Uh, any of those improvements can reduce the total cost per vehicle. So you see that assumption in my forecast. If Tesla decides they're not going to get any better at cost per vehicle, then you'll see higher costs than what I'm forecasting. All right, here's one for the Fremont Model X. Very, very similar indeed. Uh, so you've got about a $6,000 per vehicle more expensive uh, Model X than Model S. Same idea here. You know, the, the Model X is more complicated, stuff like the Falcon Wing doors the auto-presenting or auto-opening doors for the Model X, lots of other stuff, uh, more, more configurations for that one with seating configs and stuff. Uh, those sorts of things make it a little bit more expensive, probably, to produce than the Model S. Here's the Fremont Model 3. So we just saw this one get the uh, Project Highland upgrade. I smile as I say because Elon said they weren't calling it Project Highland, but everyone on the internet was. So it'll forever be known as the Highland Model 3. Uh, maybe the project team was calling it the Project Highland Model 3 and they didn't tell Elon. <laughs> he wasn't in on it uh, and uh, tweeted as much. So I've layered that cost in here as the LR slash performance package line here. I left the base cost alone and said, hey, there's just going to be some inefficiencies uh, in the near term, Q1 and Q2, relative to what we saw at the end of 2023 uh, for people getting Highland Model 3s. And I raised these other costs here a little bit, wheels, interior config, uh, etc. So I do have a higher cost of Model 3. Maybe it'll be a lot higher than that. I don't know. Uh, I did want to raise it some, so that's why you see about $1,200 more cost in Q1 uh, per Model 3 produced by Fremont than what we saw in Q4. Now, maybe I'll be wrong about that, and the Project Thailand Model 3s are actually cheaper from the get-go to make, uh, but probably it slowed the line down some, if nothing else, in Q1, which would result in higher cost per vehicle. 
uh, to try to get everybody singing off the same sheet of music uh, to produce that Model 3. Okay, Model Y, not the same uh, situation as Model 3 was in, so I do have it improving incrementally. You know, it got a little more expensive throughout the second half of 2023, I think, uh, in my model. And maybe that'll be down to 40 grand even by the end of 2024. That's what I'm forecasting. Uh, so that's that's Fremont. <laughs> then if uh, Tesla decides to start making Fremont Roadsters in Q1 of 2025, uh, they'll cost a lot. <laughs> if they can sell $12 million worth of Roadsters in Q1 of 2025, I show that they would have an average cost of $800,000 to make. Uh, that's what's sitting in my forecast. Who knows what the real numbers would be. Okay, uh, jumping the Pacific Ocean from California to China, we are now in the Shanghai section, which begins with the Model 3 at uh, 27376 Why so much less? Well, Shanghai is the most affordable production location in terms of market wage rates in terms of local suppliers of parts. Um, lots of uh, built-in advantages. Uh, that factory was purpose-built to make these products. Fremont was not. Tesla had to retrofit Fremont, so the, uh, the production path is serpentine uh, and a little inscrutable. Uh, the production line in Shanghai makes perfect sense. It's, <laughs> it's a straight line with some curves. Uh, that's way better uh, for production efficiency. So uh, that's, that's some of the things that make the uh, Shanghai Model 3 cost a lot less, I think, uh, than it costs Tesla to make the Fremont Model 3. Uh, and you can see I've got that Cost may be improving a little from the 29 grand I'm forecasting for Q4. Uh, that's less than it was in Q1, but a little more than it was in Q2 and Q3. Uh, Shanghai Model Ys, you can see what I'm forecasting here for that. A little more expensive to make the Shanghai Model Y, probably, probably a little bit uh, more materials cost for that one. Um, I, I have to guess, because Tesla does not report this information at this level of detail, how I would love if they did, and I could dial this model in a lot closer, but I don't get a lot of information I can use to get this uh, dialed in more accurately. But I am forecasting some improvement there, not, not quite $1,000 over the next year uh, and change then maybe Shanghai will make something else, maybe a next generation model, a robo taxi, a compact car, or something like that. Uh, if they do, I've got those costs starting out very high and then coming down rapidly as they scale up production of that model. Uh, I'm flexible, <laughs> as I need to be, on that unannounced model line. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff that Tesla has unannounced that I don't put in this model at all, but that's one that I have a placeholder in for uh, that is uh, destined to change, for sure, as we learn more information. All right, let's look at the Berlin section. Here's the Berlin Model Y. These costs are going to be closer to what we see from Fremont, and actually higher because Berlin doesn't make a standard range Model Y. They only make a long range, so... Uh, that's why you see a lot more cost here on the LR slash performance package line than uh, you saw in the Fremont section where they do make SR. Because uh, it's a 100% take rate on the LR. Uh, so that's how, th that's the main difference on the Berlin Model Y that makes it forty-six dollars or $47,000 per. Uh, and as they scale up volume production, what happens is the cost of labor per shift is the same, but the number of vehicles produced per shift increases. So the math is just the fraction of those things. Uh, the cost per shift divided by the Model Y's produced per shift equals a lower cost per vehicle produced, right? Uh, 
that's why you want to produce at higher volume than lower volume, all things being equal. And then maybe one day there will be another model coming out of uh, Berlin besides Model 3 and Model Y. They haven't even announced they're going to have a Model 3 yet, but I already have assumptions over here in the latter half of 2025 for them to make Model 3s that aren't even worth spending time looking at. They're just placeholders. Okay, so off we go to Texas. We've got a Texas Model Y here. I think these costs are comparable to what Fremont uh, shows today. And as, the, uh, as Austin ramps up, the cost per vehicle will improve for the same reason as Berlin. Uh, higher output per shift lowers the cost per vehicle produced. Uh, here we are with Cybertruck. This is a, a model only produced in Austin. So here are my fun Easter egg ridden cost projections because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what I put in here for this line. The volume, the, the scale is so small. Uh, we're talking about only a hundred million dollars worth of cost here uh, in Q4. Only 200 million worth of cost in Q1, right? So, uh, We'll, we'll need to see a lot more Cybertrucks coming out of Austin before these numbers will become meaningful at the scale of Tesla's income statement. So that's how you get to these numbers. Uh, so I've got an, an insane looking $1.5 million worth of cost per Cybertruck produced, meaning Tesla's losing huge amounts of money, hand over fist, delivering the 69 or so cyber trucks that got delivered in Q4, but that's what happens when you produce uh, small quantities of expensive products uh, in er, early on in the ramp of a product that was designed to be produced at a rate of like 5,000 per week, uh, something like that. Yeah, that would be a quarter million a year, uh, which is what Tesla has said they're targeting for Cybertruck. They, they could end up making a lot more than that on the line that they've designed, but it's incredibly inefficient to only make uh, less than 100 of them per month uh, out of that facility, uh, which is why you see this very high average cost per vehicle produced. That'll come down a lot. Uh, I'm saying you can cut it down to a third of this amount by Q1, which is still obviously way more than what Tesla is selling them for. So Tesla will still be losing money on Cybertruck in Q1 is my forecast. And again in Q2, maybe not by Q3. So in the, in the second, by, by the end of 2024, Tesla should be producing enough Cybertrucks that they are beyond the break-even point uh, in the production ramp. And then in 2025, when they can sell a quarter million of these, uh, at an average cost of 72 grand, uh, that'll be a lot better, assuming they're selling them at an average selling price uh, significantly higher than 72 grand. There will be Cybertruck profit aplenty in 2025 and in future years. All right, so that's that one. What about Semi? Semi is still a pretty high cost per vehicle produced, I think uh, $400,000 per Semi produced or thereabouts. Uh, and it'll take that product ramping to scale before it'll be profitable for Tesla to sell. But if they can sell them for $300,000, $350,000 each with a uh, full self-driving package or um, a platooning package where uh, they can play follow the leader uh, and basically triple the amount of stuff you can ship per truck driver, uh, that would be good. So uh, I've got that cost coming down as Tesla is able to make a lot more semis. That is contingent upon 4680 cell supply being uh, enough to make as many Cybertrucks as Tesla wants to make and as many 4680 Model Ys or whatever, but they have enough cells left over to also ramp the semi. Semi is last in priority order. Uh, so if there are not enough 4680 cells, we won't see the semi ramp up to a lot of scale, probably. 
Okay, so that takes you to the cost of sales dollars section. So if you know how many of them you sold, and if you know at what cost per delivery, then you get these dollar amounts. And uh, there you see the funny Cybertruck and semi costs. Look how small these look next to the cost of Model Y, Model 3. Even Model S and Model X look pretty small next to Model 3 and Model Y, the two best selling premium vehicles on Earth, both made by Tesla, uh, which accounts for these very large numbers here that I am projecting to become larger next year uh, than we saw them this year. So uh, that's the cost section. Then there's also a leased vehicles cost section. I just have to break them down that way because the income statement breaks them down that way. So I need to show how much revenue there is from leased vehicles versus uh, cash buyer sales. And that makes total automotive cost, right? So you add those two sections together, cash buyers plus leased equals total automotive cost of sales, which you see here. Then for the Tesla energy section, I've just got multipliers in here for the cost of sales rates that I think are applicable to each of the revenue categories. Uh, the most important of those is probably Megapack. I've got them at an 80% cost of sales in the current quarter, Q4 2023. I think that's probably about right for how Lathrop is ramping up. That percentage should improve as time goes by. I've got it improving in my forecast down to maybe 74% by the end of 2024, improving further in 2025 as Tesla expands Megapack production to China, uh, where they ought to be able to get better uh, supplier costs, etc. cetera. Uh, locally sourced cell supply, that sort of thing ought to help reduce cost more. Uh, but nowhere near the numbers, Zero Sum Game 33 was trying to sell people a year ago for Megapack gross margins. That was a funny uh, point in time when people were buying into his shtick, uh, trying to pump Tesla stock and get out. Very funny. Uh, go watch my playlist on Zero Sum Game 33 if you're interested in what I was just teasing. All right, uh, so that's the energy section. Then for the services and other section, uh, that comes in two pieces. You've got fleet cost, and then you've got uh, new vehicles added to the fleet. So I've got the, the formula here broken down separately for those two things, just looking at, all right, uh, we know what the average has been uh, for services and other costs over a long period of time. If we can compare that against the size of the fleet uh, from row 162, which we saw in stage one or part one of this video series. And then if you can uh, improve slightly on the efficiency for this area, you can get to 2.165 billion worth of cost of sales in the services and other section. There's a whole bunch of stuff in here. I mean, it's it's a lot of service center out of warranty repairs, but uh, there's Tesla insurance in here. There's the Tesla store, the online store in there, a uh, bunch of other stuff. So you just forecast a number you're happy with and go with it. So that gets you to an overall cost of sales percentage of 82.2 for Q4. Uh, and then for future quarters, I have that improving some uh, down to 76% cost of sales by the end of next year, which would be like a 23.6% gross margin. Uh, for this quarter, I've got it only at a 17.8% gross margin, which is a little bit worse than we saw in Q3, but that ought to be temporary. And in Q1, should pop back up closer to 20% for a couple of quarters. And that's just the math on every assumption we've seen above. So if you believe all the assumptions above, then you believe these are the right percentages. Then stage four is the easiest section to explain. So stage four I talked about in the very end of my 69 tweet forecast thread. So I think it was like uh, tweets number 64 through 69 we're showing you this section. Every single number that you see here is just taking the number from the cost section in stage three, dividing it by the number from the revenue section, stage two, 
and giving you how much the cost is as a percentage of uh, that detailed item. Because we used the identical format for stage three that we used in stage two, that's one of the benefits of doing it that way. It makes it extremely easy to just see what the cost of sales percentage is on everything. So these are the Model S costs here. Uh, then you've got the Model X costs here. Uh, Fremont Model 3s. Uh, you can see peaking in Q4, uh, getting better as a percentage as time goes by. Fremont Model Ys here. Uh, looking not that great in Q4, but promisingly uh, in future quarters. Uh, Shanghai Model 3s uh, should, should see some improvement here. Uh, Shanghai Model Ys, same kind of story. Uh, had a few bad quarters, but uh, hoping to see some improvement in my forecast anyway. Berlin model-wise uh, ought to be improving as time goes by. Texas model-wise, forecasting that to improve right away uh, and get a little better. Cybertrucks. <laughs> this is very funny to look at these enormous percentages, but... That's what you get when you only sell 69 of them, uh, which is my forecast for deliveries for Q4. Uh, and then the more of them you make, the better these percentages get. So yes, by the second half of 2024, I've got positive gross margin contribution anyway from Cybertruck. And the fixed costs are covered already by the other vehicles. So that's that's good that the increment, that the uh, the gross margin is additive to the overall company's profitability. Then for the semi section, as that ramps up, that cost ought to be getting a lot better. Like there's no reason you shouldn't be able to make a lot of money selling semis for three hundred grand a piece. Uh, that ought to be doable if you've got uh, a well designed factory, which I have every reason to believe Tesla has. They've just been losing money on this product because they haven't been producing very many of them. They haven't been able to prioritize that production. Okay, so here's the percentages by model. You can check that out, see how that's looking over time for each of these models. And Tesla leasing cost of sales here. The leasing percentage looks great, and you think, hey, we should just lease all the vehicles. Well, well... The problem with that is you're not getting the money up front at the time you deliver it, so you end up in a cash crunch if you do too much leasing. Uh, also, if you don't want to carry this debt yourself, uh, in terms of every time you make a vehicle, you've only got you know 30 days or 60 days or whatever to pay off your suppliers, whatever terms you negotiated with them. So whatever the cost of that vehicle is, you have to hand over to all the people who you bought parts and raw materials from. But a person who's leasing that vehicle from you, if you delivered it to them as a lease, they're only going to make monthly payments. They didn't give you money up front, right? So you're out that money. Uh, so you have a working capital problem uh, that you need to figure out you need how to finance somehow, right? So one of the ways to do that is to bundle up those leases and sell them off to a bank, uh, some other company. And there's only so much demand for that at terms that you want uh, to agree to, because uh, those banks want to make a profit off of you uh, if they agree to engage in that um, activity. So that's why we've historically seen pretty low leasing percentages from Tesla. Maybe that'll pick up with the uh, Model 3 lease getting advertised more uh, recently. And that makes your total automotive and leasing cost of sales percentages that you see here. Uh, so not that great for Q4, uh, probably, but reason to be hopeful for next year. And uh, I've just got the automotive gross margin dollars shown here. So $4 billion uh, per quarter is basically what we saw every quarter in 2023 
that might get a lot better next year. And this is the energy section. So I'm forecasting about 80% uh, cost of sales for Tesla energy. We did see a lot of improvement earlier this year. These are the numbers Tesla reported for Q1, Q2, and Q3. If you think my forecast is crazy optimistic, this isn't a forecast. These are actuals. <laughs> so I do have it taking a little step back before improving more next year. Maybe there's reason to be hopeful that Tesla's going to beat these energy forecast numbers. Uh, you can see services and other, what I'm forecasting versus what Tesla's been reporting doesn't look crazy. And that leaves you with the total cost of sales and the total gross margin. Uh, so including all products, not just automotive, it's closer to 18% in Q4 than back to 20%, 21% uh, to start next year. And that's everything I wanted to cover before I got to the income statement. So that has been uh, part four of my Tesla earnings forecast video review series. Let's check in with Loki, see how he's doing. He is still curled up in his spot and snoozing. Hey, uh, if you liked this video, don't forget to click the like button. If you didn't like this button, uh, feel free to move on to the next thing you want to do. But uh, thank you to everyone who supports me on Patreon or on X or by joining my YouTube channel as my executive producers Kathy Kitchler and Rebellionaire.com did. And I'll see you in the next one.